This is now Russia. Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk. These provinces have officially acceded to the Russian Federation, and Putin is mobilizing 300,000 men to make sure it stays that way. The tide of the war is turning, and Ukraine has taken back more territory in four days than Russia has gained in six months, and Russian nationalists are noticing. Pro-Russian commentators are openly criticizing Putin's leadership, and dozens of local politicians have called for his resignation. In response, Putin has now played his last hand. What are the political and military implications of the so-called partial mobilization and annexation? Can Putin freeze Europe into submission? Is there a danger of a nuclear strike? And when will this war end? In short, how will Putin strike back? Find out in this video. If you enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification while you're at it. Paper Tiger This is the Kharkiv Oblast. The area that has been liberated from Russian occupation is larger than the entire nation of Cyprus and represents more territory taken back by Ukraine than Russia has gained in the last six months. It also represents a significant shift in the war. The last six months involved a slow, grinding war of attrition in which Russia made slow but steady gains. That trend has now been reversed and Ukraine has proven that it can launch counterattacks to liberate its territory turning the calculus of this war on its head. Ukraine has now proven that it has the ability to win and that the massive infusions of cash and weapons from the West have not been for nothing. In military terms, the Kharkiv offensive has been disastrous for the Russians. You see, the Russian forces in Kharkiv were forced to flee, leaving behind all their heavy equipment, tanks, artillery, ammunition, you name it. In Kharkiv, Ukraine captured more than 200 Russian vehicles. That makes Russia one of the largest donors to the Ukrainian military, courtesy of Vladimir Putin. Russia's influence abroad is also collapsing as a result of its failures in Ukraine. In the Caucasus, Azerbaijan has taken advantage of Russia's weakness and the distraction in Ukraine to launch a new war against Russian ally Armenia. In Georgia, the government is holding a referendum on whether to start a war to take back the separatist regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which Russia captured in 2008. In the future, we might see attempts by Moldova to take back the Russian-backed separatist region of Transnistria. Countries in Russia's backyard are taking advantage of its weakness to strike back. At the same time, traditionally pro-Russian nations are hedging their bets. Armenia, a member of the CSTO, or Russian NATO, requested military support from Russia against Azerbaijan, but only received diplomatic support, forcing it to turn towards Iran for protection. At the same time, two other CSTO members, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, have launched attacks against each other. Meanwhile, Kazakhstan, traditionally a Russian ally, is devising plans to export its oil to Europe through Azerbaijan therefore bypassing Russia and undermining Russia's energy monopoly. Everywhere, Russia's geopolitical influence is crumbling. Russia is now isolated. This isolation is exemplified by the fact that the only two countries that have supplied weapons to Russia are Iran and North Korea. But the biggest threat to Putin is domestic. Виновна в этом поражении Министерство обороны и Генеральный штаб. Еще парочка оскорбительных военных поражений, и вот мы получаем ту самую революционную ситуацию. Мы подошли к черте, за которой надо вот просто понимать простую вещь. Победить военную вот мобилизацию, сказать, общем, мобилизацию там сознание или экономика. Начать переговоры о прекращении а, войны а, понятно, и да. перейти Вы к политическим вопросам. Russian nationalists and fascists who most strongly supported Putin and the war are openly criticizing Putin for not going far enough and not committing enough troops to the war. If Putin were to alienate his most ardent supporters and be seen to be losing the war, that could provide fertile ground for a military coup. And it's this factor, the threat to Putin's power, that has been the most important in Putin's decision to escalate the war. You see, one of the many reasons why Russia has struggled to defeat Ukraine is simply the fact that its manpower is stretched far too thin. 200,000 troops sounds like a lot until you realize that these forces are stretched across a front line that is 
thousands of kilometers long. And while Putin handcuffed himself by declaring this a special military operation and limiting the number of men he could use, Zelensky has mobilized 750,000 men. Even before September, desperate for manpower, Russia was recruiting prisoners and mercenaries to fight in the war and has even offered Russian citizenship to migrants who join. So the one thing that could turn the tide of war back in Russia's favor is a sudden surge in troop numbers. Partial mobilization. On the 21st of September 2022, Vladimir Putin announced partial mobilization of all men with military experience, immediately drafting 300,000 men to fight in Ukraine. This is the largest mobilization of the Russian military since the Second World War. And to make sure this mobilization is effective, the Russian parliament has passed new laws instituting tough penalties on draft dodgers, deserters and looters. On top of that, the contracts of the soldiers already fighting in Ukraine have now been extended until the end of partial mobilization, whenever that is. It's important to understand that this mobilization will not be limited to just these 300,000. Russia has compulsory military service, so anyone who has completed their service is eligible to be mobilized, which includes up to 25 million men. If executed properly, this could be a game changer for Russia, but it also comes with serious political risks for Putin. For starters, it's not even clear that the mobilization will have the intended battlefield effect. The soldiers deployed to Ukraine were Russia's best troops, professional soldiers who knew what they were doing. But they were failed by poor logistics, incompetent leadership and poorly maintained equipment due to the massive amounts of corruption in Russia. The 300,000 soldiers who are now being drafted are not full-time soldiers but reservists and conscripts. These are people who did their basic training years ago and haven't touched a gun in years. They do not have the experience or the advanced training that the initial invasion force had and it will take months to train them properly and deploy them to Ukraine. Mobilization was needed yesterday, not six months from now. And the truth is that they don't have enough instructors to train them, officers to lead them, or modern equipment to arm them. The mobilization infrastructure set up by the Soviet Union has long since rotted away. Mobilization only solves one problem, manpower shortages, but it doesn't solve poor logistics, shortages of equipment, or poor leadership. It might even make those problems worse by sending poorly trained, poorly equipped, and poorly motivated men into Ukraine who are more likely to surrender, desert, or die. The fact that Russia is now pulling 1960s era T-62 tanks out of storage is just one sign of how bad things are. But the biggest risk is political. Putin launched this invasion as a so-called special military operation. The call for partial mobilization is proof that Russia is losing the war. And if Putin's mobilization order does not significantly alter battlefield dynamics, it will only make his leadership look more incompetent, making him vulnerable to a military coup. Putin's mobilization order proves that this is in fact a war that will require immense sacrifices from the Russian people. According to independent polling by the Levada Center, the majority of Russians, 76%, support the war. The majority of Russians, 77%, support Putin. But the majority of Russians don't want to put their lives on the line for a special military operation. And it shows. Since the mobilization order, 17 mobilization centers have been set on fire and one man even fired bullets into a recruitment center in Siberia. Flight tickets to visa-free destinations like Armenia and Turkey have completely sold out and massive lines have formed at Russia's borders with Kazakhstan, Finland and Georgia. Search results for how to leave Russia and how to break an arm are going through the roof. And despite severe restrictions on protests, people have taken to the streets across Russia against the draft, with over 2,000 people being arrested. In a twist of irony, those people protesting against the draft have now been drafted. The truth is that Russians were supportive of the war as long as it did not significantly affect their day-to-day -day lives. Now, the sanctions did hurt Russian people. After all, inflation in Russia is among the highest in Europe at 14.3%. 
However, the pain inflicted by sanctions could easily be blamed on the West, not on Putin. Partial mobilization is different. Over 20 years, Putin has successfully depoliticized the Russian population. In exchange for economic prosperity and political stability, Russians disengaged from politics and accepted authoritarian rule. In other words, Putin and his cronies could get rich as long as they did not interfere in people's personal lives. But by turning towards mass conscription, Putin has broken his end of the deal. If Putin isn't careful, he could be facing much stronger opposition to the war from angry mothers and wives who have lost their sons and husbands and youths who refuse to fight in the war. He needs an ideological justification to escalate this war and mobilize Russian society. Putin needs to convince the Russian people that the Russian homeland itself is at stake. And there's only one way to do that. Popular referendums. At the end of September, popular referendums were held in Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson, which each have a Russian-speaking population of 75%, 69%, 48%, and 25% respectively. The percentage that voted to join Russia? 98%, 98%, 98%, 98%, So what is all this about? Why has Putin staged popular referendums in regions that aren't even fully controlled by Russia? After all, we all know that these referendums have been rigged. People were forced to vote at gunpoint. Prisoners of war were made to vote. The hostile security situation made it impossible to hold a free and fair election and significant areas of these regions remain under Ukrainian control. Even in Crimea, where there was a genuine desire to join Russia, there was a major discrepancy between the polls and the referendum results. Polls from before 2014 showed that 63.8% of Crimeans wanted to join with Russia. But in the referendum, 97% voted to join Russia. Unlike Crimea, however, no such majority support for secession ever existed either in the Donbas or the more recently annexed regions of Ukraine. Remember the scenes from Kharkiv of Ukrainians welcoming the Ukrainian army as liberators? Those are Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Kharkiv is 44% Russian-speaking. You see, while these regions do have significant Russian-speaking populations, no polls conducted before or after 2014 indicated that a majority wanted to join Russia. And whatever pro-Russian sentiment might have existed before, the war has extinguished that. So if these referendums are clearly a sham, why go ahead with them? You see, most Russians who support the war support it for two reasons. Firstly, they view it as a war of defense against NATO and Ukrainian Nazis. Up till now, the war has only been fought on Ukrainian soil and in what Russia considers to be the independent republics of Luhansk and Donetsk. Now that these regions have been formally annexed into the Russian Federation, any Ukrainian attacks on these territories will constitute an attack on Russia itself. With an attack on the Russian homeland, Putin can justify to his people the need for a general mobilization and mass conscription as self-defense. Secondly, Russians view the war as necessary to protect the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine. Polls show that 45% of Russians want Kherson and Zaporizhia to join the Russian Federation, 21% believe that they should become independent states, and just 14% believe that they should remain part of Ukraine. With referendums, Putin can show the Russian people that the so-called special military operation is worth it and that they are fighting for a good cause. The liberation of Russian-speaking people who genuinely want to join Russia. But there's one other more sinister reason. Since this is a special military operation, Putin cannot legally deploy conscripts outside of Russia if he hasn't declared war. But once those regions are annexed, they become part of Russia and technically the conscripts will be deployed in Russia, not in a foreign country. Therefore, annexation allows Putin to do mobilization. And then there's the nuclear aspect. Putin has threatened the use of nukes. A nuclear weapons convoy has been spotted moving closer to Ukraine and the Russian public is being prepared for the possibility of nuclear attack. Russia's nuclear doctrine states that Russia can only use nuclear weapons in two situations. If another country uses nuclear weapons against Russia, or if another country attacks Russia using conventional weapons, but only when the very existence of the state is threatened. 
Now, obviously, a Ukrainian attack on Russian-occupied territories does not constitute a threat to the very existence of the Russian state, but it could easily be twisted this way using propaganda. Now that these Ukrainian regions have been annexed, Putin has the legal justification he needs to launch a limited nuclear strike on Ukraine. Now, this is incredibly unlikely. Ukraine has already launched attacks on Belgorod in Russia and in Crimea, which is considered part of Russia, and there has been no nuclear response. The point of threatening with nukes is to scare Ukraine's European allies into reducing their support for Ukraine, or at the very least, putting pressure on Ukraine to limit its attacks on Russia, including the annexed regions. But Putin's response doesn't necessarily have to be military. Economic warfare will do just fine. Winter is coming. Assuming all goes well, partial mobilization could give Russia the numbers it needs to push back against Ukraine. But this won't be effective unless Russia can find a way to stop or decrease the infusions of cash and weapons from the West. And in order to do that, it needs to put pressure on the West in the only way that it can. Energy. On the 27th of September, mysterious attacks caused leakages to two Nord Stream gas pipelines running through the Baltic Sea. We simply don't know if Russia or another country is responsible for this. Regardless, over the last few months, Russia has been systematically cutting off Europe from its gas supply. Since February 2022, Russia has reduced gas exports to the EU by 78%. The tactic here is simple. Divide Europe. Europe could face up to a 10% gas shortfall this winter. However, the burden will be distributed unevenly. Czechia, Slovakia and Hungary could face up to a 40% shortfall. Germany and Austria a 15% shortfall. What Putin is banking on is that the countries more dependent on Russian gas will break ranks and try to score a deal with Putin. Already, mass protests have erupted in Czechia against surging energy prices and Czechia's membership of the EU and NATO. The recent Italian election has brought to power far-right Eurosceptic populists who may or may not be more favorable to Putin. For now, the European public is supportive of Ukraine, even if it means higher energy prices. But by turning up the pressure, Putin is hoping that the voting public will choose their wallets over Ukraine and put pressure on their governments to make a deal. If Putin can freeze Europe this winter and push gas prices high enough to get a few countries to turn, he can divide Europe and break their unified support for Ukraine. But this is easier said than done, because Europe has prepared for this. The EU set targets for all member states to fill up their gas reserves to 80% before October 1st. Europe met that target ahead of schedule on 31 August, and reserves are now filled to 90%. However, it achieved this by paying six times more for the gas because it had to rely on expensive LNG imports instead of cheap Russian gas. The EU has also set gas reduction targets of 15%, and on average, countries have so far achieved a 10% gas reduction. With these measures, the issue will not be so much that Europe will run out of gas and freeze, but the cost of that gas, which could push Europe into recession. And for this, the EU and national governments have implemented a raft of measures to keep down prices. Because the price of electricity was based on the price for the highest cost producer, in this case gas, electricity prices from non-gas sources have also gone up. And so the EU is now decoupling the price of electricity from the price of gas and placing caps on the revenues that can be earned by non-gas electricity producers. It has also placed a price cap on Russian gas. Most importantly, however, European governments have responded to the surge in energy prices with policies to cushion the effects of price rises on their citizens. The EU has agreed to allow the taxing of windfall profits of gas and oil companies, which can then be redistributed to citizens struggling to pay their energy bills. Many countries have already implemented this, and Germany alone has already spent 62 billion euros on subsidies, equivalent to the entire Russian military budget while several countries have introduced price caps to prevent further price increases. Many countries have accelerated their renewable energy targets, and Germany finally has reversed its boneheaded energy policy and agreed to reopen its nuclear power stations. Yet even with these measures, a moderate recession is still likely. The ECB estimates that the Eurozone is headed for a 0.6% decline in GDP in 2023. Now, this is still a lot less than the 4% decline experienced during the 2008 crisis or the 
4.2% decline predicted for Russia by its own economy ministry. Putin realizes he cannot stop Western support for Ukraine entirely. For starters, none of his energy warfare affects the United States, which is the number one supplier of arms to Ukraine. But he could put pressure on European countries to reduce some of their support and use that as leverage to try to convince Ukraine to limit its attacks and come to some sort of negotiated settlement. But Putin can only play this game for so long. Right now, Russia can make the same amount of money or more by selling less gas due to the inflated prices. Europe is paying the same amount for 75% less Russian gas. But as gas prices come down, this will change. Already, Russia is receiving less money for gas than it did at the beginning of the war, with prices coming down to 2021 levels, and that number will keep going down as Europe transitions permanently to alternative suppliers. European purchases of oil are also down 17%, with an EU ban on the import of Russian tanker oil taking effect in December. In the long run, Russia cannot keep up this game. 40% of the Russian government budget comes from energy revenues, and most of the gas revenues come from Europe. You see, while Europe relies on Russia for 40% of its gas imports, Russia relies on Europe for 83% of its gas exports. And unlike oil, gas primarily travels through pipelines, which means that it cannot easily be diverted to alternative markets. In other words, in the long run, Russia is more dependent on Europe than the other way around. If Europe can survive this winter, it will be the last winter that Russia can use energy as a weapon. And that leaves Putin only one choice to salvage some sort of victory. A fragile truce. Putin needs some sort of victory to demonstrate to the Russian people and his elite supporters why the sacrifices made for this war were necessary. If the combination of mobilization, annexation, and energy manipulation doesn't work, then Putin is in a tough spot. The only other way to claim some sort of victory is through a negotiated settlement. But is a peace deal even possible? According to Elon Musk, yes. And while we may laugh at his proposal, in truth it does contain some of the axes along which a peace deal would be negotiated. Those axes are, in order of importance, the status of Crimea, NATO membership, the status of the Donbass and other occupied regions, EU membership, and the rights of Russian speakers in Ukraine. Now, both Ukraine and Russia have their red lines when it comes to these axes. Russia will never give up Crimea due to historical reasons, the presence of a genuinely pro-Russian population, and the presence of the Sevastopol naval base. Similarly, Ukraine has put a red line on territorial concessions, with 87% of Ukrainians being against any kind of territorial concession, even if it prolongs the war. Even 57% of ethnic Russian Ukrainians oppose this. Only 24% of ethnic Russian Ukrainians support giving up land for peace. And redoing referendums in the other occupied regions would simply not work as there would be no way to enforce the results if people don't vote to join Russia. NATO membership, on the other hand, may be the only area where a clear deal could be made. While Zelensky has now formally applied for NATO membership, as recently as March, Ukraine offered to accept becoming neutral if it receives adequate security guarantees from Western nations. In other words, Ukraine would not join NATO or allow foreign troops or bases on its soil in exchange for legally binding security guarantees from Western nations if it were ever attacked. This is in fact closest to the status quo as Ukraine cannot join NATO as long as it has territorial disputes. As Zelensky said, for us, NATO is the simplest and least painful concession. Yet even this would be a hard pill to swallow, with 83% of Ukrainians in favor of NATO membership, up from 55% before the war. As for EU membership, this is lower on Russia's priority list, and the use of Russian and other minority languages at the local level is already allowed under Ukrainian law. But the sad truth is that a peace deal is only possible if both sides believe that they have more to gain by negotiating than by continuing to fight. Ukraine believes it can take back its territory through military means, and has recently liberated new areas of Kherson and Lyman, so it will not accept territorial concessions, if it can simply take back those areas by force. Similarly, Putin believes he can hold on to the annexed regions through mobilization, and so this war will continue until it reaches an unbreakable stalemate.
With recent losses in Ukraine, is Putin vulnerable to a military coup? Find out in this video. Consider becoming a Patreon to support the channel. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Thank you to my Patreons including Linda, Richard and many more for making this video possible. Like, share and subscribe. Because this was my take.